Hello and welcome to Bud's RPG Review, where I give my thoughts on role-playing games, card games and board games. Today's review is the Tales from the Loop starter set by Free League Publishing. Ok, first a bit of history. Tales from the Loop is an any award-winning role-playing setting based on the evocative art of Simon Stolenhag that is marketed as role-playing in the 80s that never was. A game where you play as children aged 10 to 15 years old using the Year Zero game engine. It's since gone on to be made into a TV series on Amazon Prime. Released in April 2020, the Tales from the Loop starter set is a boxed, cut-down version of the main rules, designed to introduce new players to the setting, rules and principles of the game. To the cover. Here we have a beautiful piece by Simon Stolenhag that showcases part of the reason that the setting is as popular as it is. Right, to the inside. While the box itself is of nice, sturdy construction, the contents are slightly underwhelming, as they only fill half the box. We have 10 Tales from the Loop dice, a really good quality double-sized map that shows both the Swedish and American loop, five illustrated double-sided pre-gen kid characters, A 32 page rules book, done in an 80s style, marked as read this first. And the 16 page introductory mystery, The Recycled Boy. Ok, so as it says read this first, let's start with the rules. We open the book to chapter 1, Welcome to the Loop, where it gives a nice example of day to day life in the area, including one of the game master and players playing out a small scene. After this it goes into what Tales from the Loop is about. It is described as a game where the players deal with mysteries as a group of friends who are kids aged 10 to 15 set in an alternative version of the 1980s, a place full of nagging parents, ever-present homework and school life. The mysteries enable the kids to have strange and wondrous encounters with machines and creatures that exist due to the presence of the Loop, a massive underground particle accelerator from the 1960s. This allows them to escape the humdrum of everyday life and have exciting, meaningful and sometimes dangerous adventures which could leave them hurt or changed in some other way. It then goes into how role-playing works, which is pretty standard fare for those who've role-played before. It talks about the two loops, one in Sweden and one in America. The Swedish one is on the Molaren Islands west of Stockholm. The other is in Boulder City, Nevada. They are sister facilities. It also touches briefly on playing in your hometown. After this we have a small box out to discuss the core rulebook, explaining how it contains comprehensive rules for creating your own kids etc, and then it covers the core mechanic. In Tales from the Loop tests are resolved by rolling d6s. The players will have a number of d6s for each skill as a numeric rating on their character sheet, and any roll of a 6 is a success, with there being some instances of needing more than one success. We then move on to some of the core ideas of the setting, principles of the loop. There are six guiding principles that should be used. The first one is that your hometown is full of strange and fantastic things. The loop is a place of huge floating transport vessels, time portals, strange beasts, cyborgs, robots and experiments gone awry, and it is all seen through the eyes of kids as a place of magic and wonder. The second is that everyday life is dull and unforgiving. Think the constant drudgery of school, homework, parents and the like. There are setbacks at every corner and the adults seem to do what they want, but you have to do what they say. Relief from it all comes in short bursts. The third is that adults are out of reach and out of touch. They don't listen, nor understand, so asking them to help with the mysteries you uncover seems pointless. The kids are, for the most part, on their own. Not that the adults would believe them either way, if they can fit it in between their constant nagging and arguing, and it is often the mistakes of adults that the kids need to fix. The fourth is that the land of the loop is dangerous, but kids will not die. They can be hurt, locked up, kidnapped, robbed or bullied, but in this game they can't die. The fifth is that the game is played scene by scene, similar to the movies. The game is run on the basis that not every tiny detail is played out. And the final principle is that the world is described collaboratively. The GM sets the scene, but the players are supposed to describe the things in their town, like the weather, what the school looks like, etc. The kids should be asked questions to flesh out the world. Things like, what does your mother look like? Or, what are you wearing? Strange and bizarre descriptions should prompt the reminder that everyday life is dull and unforgiving. This should only happen in the mysteries, and the GM always has the final say. After this we move on to chapter 2, The Age of the Loop. Here it describes the setting, the 80s that never was. 
It is set in an iconic period of the 1980s, a time experienced in the likes of The Goonies, E.T., Flight of the Navigator, you know the kind of movie. Synthwave music dominates the radio when people have affordable home computers and video recorders for the first time. It was a time where anything seemed possible, but also one of fear and conflict due to the Cold War. In this version of the 80s, twin particle accelerators were set up in Sweden and the US, and robots are commonplace, as well as 10,000 ton Gauss freighters that glide through the sky. The Age of Discovery stemmed from the years following World War II, and the experimental research programmes that ultimately yielded something called the magnetrine effect that gave us the floating ships that are present in the Northern Hemisphere. The US built the particle accelerator in the 50s in Boulder City, Nevada, which produced unclear scientific findings, and then Sweden formed an agency called Riksenergi that built the world's largest accelerator outside Stockholm to create one of the most ambitious experiments of the time. The inhabitants came up with the name The Loop. In Japan at the time, Iwasaka managed to perfect the self-balancing machine, allowing robots to become more commonplace. It gives us 10 movies from the 80s that the game is trying to create the atmosphere of, as well as 8 high-tech companies currently in existence, and a timeline from the discovery of the magnetrine effect in the 1950s through to strange sightings around the loop. It then goes on to talk about Sweden in the 1980s. Often described as a socialist utopia, some see it as a failed attempt at finding the marriage between capitalism and communism. The government is the Social Democratic Party, who have sat in power since World War II. Education and healthcare are free, and there are only two state-owned TV channels. The country has remained neutral and is not aligned with NATO or the Warsaw Pact, and was never occupied during the war, and have good relations with the Soviet Union and America, though the former are seen as an enemy by the general populace. Rumours abound that the Swedish government has conducted secret research and intelligence projects with the US. An incident with a Soviet submarine in southern Sweden caused them to step up their defence efforts. The society is in a state of flux, with the cultural influence of the US and UK causing a celebration of the capitalist way in Stockholm in the form of yuppies. Role-playing games such as Draco Och Demona and Mutant are popular, and the Commodore 64 can be found in many homes. In 1986, the Prime Minister is murdered in downtown Stockholm, with nobody ever being arrested for it, and this sparked the end of an age of innocence in Sweden. Normal life continues day by day, with long cold winters and short beautiful summers. Kids feel stuck between the past and a hopeful future. American movies are copied and played on home video recorders, while computer games are pirated and passed about like contraband, and the music is a mixture of heavy metal and synth pop. Kids read comics and magazines, and parents generally let them keep to themselves without interfering. It's a decade of spiralling divorce numbers, with many kids growing up in two homes. School is mandatory from age 7 up till 16, and English is taught from early on, which is mostly handy for kids to watch TV with. Teachers are archaic, but well-meaning, and absolutely out of touch, and for some kids, it's a time of torturous existence at the hands of others. After this, we move on to the US loop. The whole thing started with a top-secret military project in Nevada, Boulder City to be exact, a sleepy town 30 minutes drive from Las Vegas. It was originally built to investigate the possibility of instantaneous teleportation between two places, under the auspices of DARPA as a method of instantly shifting troops around the globe, though that initial promise was never destined to be. America in the 1980s is not the same as the one from the movies. Strange airships glide across the sky, robots perform heavy labour, and this is all perfectly normal to the kids. It's the time of Ronald Reagan in power and people wanting to trust the government again, after that trust was shattered by Nixon and Watergate, and there seems to be a constant threat of nuclear holocaust. The CIA refuses demands by Congress to stop helping the Contra rebels in Nicaragua, and they are illegally procuring funds by selling American weaponry to Iran. None of this really matters to the kids, though. Military service is voluntary, though men have to register for the draft at 18, and the 80s are relatively peaceful. There are only four major TV stations, ABC, CBS, NBC and PBS, with Fox joining in the mid-80s. Toy companies are also now allowed by law to make cartoons based on their products, things like He-Man, Thundercats and Transformers. Kids in the 80s sit in the middle ground of a wild past and an uncertain, complicated future. Cell phones are like bricks and often in a car, so pay phones are mostly used. There's no GPS, just paper maps. They start school at age 5, and divorce levels peak in the 80s, leaving many broken homes, though they spend most of their time in school. Kids listen to music, including a new style called rap, and play them on portable cassette players. VCRs are commonplace, with kids trading full tapes of TV shows and movies, and they also play the likes of Dungeons and Dragons, Traveller and Merp. In some places, these and heavy metal music are banned due to their now infamous satanic panic. Most homes don't have a computer, but those that do usually have an Apple II or Commodore 64. 
This all changes in 1985 when the NES reaches American shores. We then move on to chapter 3. Here we talk about the kids. As has been previously mentioned, in Tales from the Loop, players run a kid between 10 to 15 years old. Each kid has four attributes, body, tech, heart and mind. Body is essentially running, jumping, climbing and sneaking. Tech is the ability to understand machines, robots and technology. Heart is the ability to make friends, lie, persuade and know the right people. And mind is the ability to understand things, solve riddles and find weak points. They also have a number of luck points. These allow them the ability to re-roll dice. Younger kids are luckier than older kids, and all kids start with a number of points equal to 15 minus their age, and they are replenished at the beginning of each session. As the kid grows older, they are reduced by one each year. Each attribute has skills associated with it listed here. Items are a useful commodity in Tales from the Loop, and can give bonus dice to roll. For example, a skateboard gives a bonus to move when running away, but not when climbing a tree. All kids start playing with an iconic item, which gives them two bonus dice in an appropriate situation where trouble can be overcome. It won't disappear or break unless the kid wants it to, and if it's stolen or lost, it'll be found by the end of the mystery and cannot be used by other kids. Occasionally, new items may be found and give bonuses too. All kids start with a drive, a reason for their exposure to dangerous situations, as well as a problem from everyday life. They also have a pride, something that they consider to be important and valuable. The pride can be used to put you in trouble by the GM by them setting up a scene that highlights or threatens it. Pride is presented as something that is present in order to understand and play the kid. Once per mystery, pride can be used to get a single automatic success on a die roll, even after a failed roll. As has been previously mentioned, kids can't die in Tales from the Loop. They suffer from conditions. If a trouble is attempted to be overcome but failed, or a dice roll is pushed, more on that in a bit, the kid may be forced to take a condition. There are five conditions. Four are mild. They are upset, scared, exhausted and injured. And one is bad. Broken. Conditions are decided upon by the kid in the given situation and a single one of them gives a minus one to the amount of dice rolled and this is added to with each extra condition gained. So with four conditions they are minus four dice. The broken condition means that they are mentally or physically hurt and automatically fail all rolls until they are healed. Conditions, aside from representing the consequences of the real world, are role-playing opportunities for the players. Next, we move on to Chapter 4. The first part is titled Trouble, and it is usually a dangerous thing that happens that prevents the kids from doing something that they need to overcome. It also gives us a list of typical troubles, things like your parents start arguing again or your classmates don't believe you. Troubles can sometimes trigger a condition if they are not overcome. The player has to describe how their kid overcomes the trouble and rolls a number of dice equal to the score in the attribute they are using and a rolled 6 is a success. Players may adjust the roll by using their iconic item, which gives them 2 extra dice to roll, and or their pride wants per mystery to give an automatic success. Luck points can be used to re-roll failed dice, and only one luck point can be used on a single dice roll. Sometimes incredibly difficult situations may require more than one success, as illustrated in this table here. It also mentions that in Tales from the Loop there are no turns or initiative and to let the dialogue decide what happens in a reasonable manner. Some skills can let you question the GM, who must answer them truthfully, and should you roll more successes than are required for the test, the player can buy further effects for each extra success. For example, they could humiliate an opponent. These effects are listed with the relevant skill. NPCs never have to roll to overcome a trouble. The GM simply decides whether they do. If an NPC helps a player, they can give up to three bonus dice. Unsuccessfully rolling to beat a trouble should never result in nothing happening and should always make the situation a bit worse, maybe adding a condition or a complication. This is a success but something else happens, for example you try to climb over a fence and do it but alert the guard dog. Players can also push a roll. This involves immediately retrying the task with the player explaining how they are doing this. The player adds a fitting condition and re-rolls all non-sixes. Should it again fail it can't be pushed again, though luck or pride can be used. If the trouble came with a condition as a threat of failure, the player can take two further ones and push the roll. Kids can also help each other out. Only one at a time can help, and they describe what they are doing and add an extra die to the roll. However, any threat from the outcome includes the helper. There is also extended trouble. This is where the kids need to come up with a plan together, with a single die roll settling the outcome. Firstly, the GM sets the stakes, i.e. what will happen on failure. Then the threat level is determined. This is the number of successes they need to get in order to pass, usually twice the number of kids. The kids then make a plan deciding which skills to use, and after this the scene is played out. This leads to the outcome. 
If the final number of sixes is less than half required, it is a complete failure. If it is half or more, then the kids each pick a condition, with each one counting as an extra six. They can even make themselves broken. If they reach the threat level, they achieve what they set out to do. It then moves on to skills and what they can do, with the skill lead being of particular interest, as it allows a kid to add to a pool of dice when they team up to overcome a trouble. The other book in the set is the bundled scenario, The Recycled Boy. I'm not going to spoil it here, however it's fair to say that it's pretty decent and gives a good taster of what Tales from the Loop has to offer. It's also worth mentioning that a lot of the art seems to be tied to the scenario in order to show the players what is happening. The Tales from the Loop starter set has many good points, but falls short in a few areas. The box is sturdy, the books are nicely done with lovely glossy paper, and there is fabulous art throughout. And also, it's nice to see official dice as part of a starter set, as I feel that they are often an afterthought. The Loop is a really interesting place to have adventures, and the alternative 80s has been well thought out. Having kids as the heroes is something that's different to the norm, and the system is good if at times a bit confusing. For example, the minus one to dice for gaining conditions is poorly explained, as it implies that it is a minus one penalty to the rolls, something I had to go onto Twitter to clarify, encountering others who had had the same issue. The art being slightly repurposed to fit the contained scenario is actually quite clever, as the GM can show the players what is going on. However, there are issues with it. Firstly, there is only one short scenario. When you compare this with the three that you get with the Call of Cthulhu starter set, and the entire town you get with the Warhammer one, it looks like slim pickings being particularly evident when you see that the box is only half full. Even the Numenera set gave you a continuation of the scenario contained in the box online. But this, nothing. I feel that with a couple more extra bundle scenarios and a few character advancements, this could have been a must-buy, but unfortunately that's just not the case. What is contained is great, and the incredible inspiring art by Simon Stolenhag absolutely evokes an 80s that never was, and the rules feel like they were built around every 80s movie involving kids that you can think of, getting every aspect spot on. But where the starter set falls down is in terms of value. The set is £25 in the UK, which is a lot to pay for what is essentially a cut down version of the rules in a session or two's gaming, and it is here where it fails to hit the spot. Even the inclusion of a simple GM shield would have made this a much more attractive prospect. But as it stands, despite being a really good game that accomplishes what it sets out to do, it's just that bit too expensive. I give it a 6.5 out of 10. If you enjoyed this review, please make sure to hit the thumbs up, subscribe to my channel and check out my other videos. Also, if you're interested in buying this product, I'll put some links below. Lastly, if you like what I produce here, then maybe think about supporting me on Patreon. But out.